This episode of the Good Ship Brothership is brought to you by Stitches. Fell down the stairs and cracked your head open on the basement floor? Gushing blood everywhere? Try Stitches. Hit in the head by an ornamental katana that you didn't think was as sharp as it turned out it was? And now you're gushing blood all over the ceiling? Try Stitches. Go to www.ouchstitches.net and receive 23% off your first gash today. Stitches. That was difficult. Oh, bro, chacho! I had never heard the term bro chacho until you used it today while we were driving. Today, and, really? Yeah. So today's St. Patrick's Day when we're recording, and we went into town and we were looking at all the bro chachos who were celebrating St. Patrick's Day, and I had never heard that word until you, you used it. And I think it's a good descriptor of someone who celebrates St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, yeah. By going around well, in different the, pubs. The it's also. Um, I think bro chacho is used to describe your bro chachos. Levels are really low. That's true. That's weird. Look at it compared to when That's I was doing weird. my sponsorship. Yeah. Well, I did turn it down a little bit, but it's also low. Well, no, it should be fine. Anyway. Okay. Um, I did, uh, I did, uh, hear it used as well, um, w in reference to beer, when beer is referred to as a brew cha cho. Oh, yeah. Um, but I'm pretty sure it can also be, it's also a term, bro cha cho, in reference to bro cha chos. You know? Yeah. <sighs> Mother fricker. I've spilt tea and we're like f literally 35 seconds in. So, with that in mind, welcome to the good shit bro cha cho this, ship. <laughs> this is for sure the last episode we're doing of this stupid trash heap of a show. It's not true, guys. Oh, you vey. We have a very and special Cooper, show coming up. Look at Cooper, the dog Cooper's claws snagged on my oh, on my shirt there penalty. when he was trying to climb over top of my chest. You were dog sitting, and, and it's pretty cute, but he keeps getting into mischief. So. I made the mistake of laying in front of him, uh, and then my dad was trying to beckon him over top from from the other side mm -hmm. of me as I lay on the floor, and instead of of course like a normal person just walking around me. He decided to climb, summit me. Well, he is my. A... I I think he mistook my pecs for mountains. He is pretty small. I'm pretty huge. Okay. Um and. Hey! Get out! Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> that's not the... okay. That's I'm sorry. You do. That I need to learn how to laugh yeah, quieter. No, I, I just guffaw really it's, dorkily. Yeah. You really do. <laughs> it makes a listening experience a lot more epileptic. Okay, uh, should we? Uh, that's that yeah, song good. sounded pretty no. <laughs> pretty good. No, that's for season two. Yeah. Hold on, I need to find our. Oh, that's a good idea. Welcome aboard the Good Ship Brothership, everybody. Yeah, Here. that's right. Yeah. Here we go. Ready? Go. So we should inform you that we have uh, some. Oh, nice. Grant's pulled up a document that just says, I want to die on it. So that's good. Took that for the purpose of a Snapchat that uh, I sent to Randy. That has nothing to do with anything, or does it? So today we're actually going to be oh, getting hey, some... Hey, uh, okay, hey, 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 we're, we'll do that after the... Okay. Oh no. I have to open the... Uh, Ready? Here we go. Here we go. I think I already finished my tea. Dun, dun, also, dun, I'm gonna wipe beer and you're gone, so that's kind of weird. Oh, whoa. Was that? Oh, it faded out. What? You're aboard the Good Ship Brothership, the only arts podcast that covers film, music, gaming, and literature, as well as toenail trimming collections. I'm Grant, and this is my brother, Jason. What are we talking about today? I think you did that wrong. No, I don't think so. Are you serious? No, I, I think you know. What are we talking about today? Come on. Uh, today, we're speaking on the topics of um, the the uh, excellent game Grim Fandango, the critically acclaimed game, and we're also talking about the album Electric Warrior by uh, T-Rex, which is kind of a... We'll, we'll get into it uh, once we yeah. flip the puppet, but... but Suffice it to say, it's a bit of a hidden gem. I'd say, I'd say it's it's a it's a beautiful, exquisite fossil that's buried just below the surface. Yeah, that's true. Uh, now, 
On the show today, uh, we are drinking tea, but we're also eating chocolate I've cake. I've already finished my tea. So I'm sorry. I'm still drinking tea. Also, I'm wearing wife beater, Grant's not, so... I drink my tea. Maybe at some point you can get one, I don't know. Yeah. I think we should... Oh, jeez. This is a very big piece oh, of cake. Yes. Kick. It looks so good, though. It's even gluten-free. <laughs> oh, I've completely... Oh, no. So, uh... I'm giving you the ugly piece. Okay. Well, <laughs> I am the okay. ugly piece. That's I very simple. Hold on, hold on. Life. There's more scrapes yeah, okay, here. Okay, I was gonna say, yeah, let's... Come don't on. be... Don't be a stranger I'll there. eat my We're piece brothers. out of the... Hold on, there's still more. Well, I brought down two, uh... I brought down two plates because I thought maybe we want to be a little bit fancier. Why? Nobody can see us. <laughs> I can see you. <laughs> I don't, don't want to see you eating out of a plastic Why? container like an animal. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's flip the puppet. Yeah. What side should be what? I always decide. Let me flip and you decide. Okay. Okay, uh... Electric Warrior, if the puppet lands on the ground face up. And uh, Grim Fandango, if it lands face down. Here we go. It's Spaghetti. Dead. It's face down. Grim Fandango. Okay, so I'll give a little backstory yeah. on Grim Fandango first. Excuse me. Okay, can yeah. Okay, I've yeah. got I got Sorry. a beef with your burps okay. recently. You you've got this thing of embellishing them, pushing them out, and like drawing them out, and like I I never say this about burps, but frankly, it's a little gross. Here's the and thing. like, hold on, and it's just, it's just a little rude. And if you do a burp and you just let it be and you let it leave okay. when it needs to leave, it's fine. You know, that's never gross, but it's when you're like, uh, and like pushing it. I gotta be honest with purposefully. you. Purposefully. I say this unironically, like I'm not even joking, not like trying to be funny. I oftentimes when we're doing this <gasps> kind of forget that we're actively recording and one or two people is going to hear this outside of us. Hey Ben. And so oftentimes I will burp like that and then hey, i'm Emerson. like oh i shouldn't have done that hey Jonathan. seriously so like i did that and i was like oh i shouldn't you know i could have stifled that a little bit more so maybe connor sorry guys sorry yeah. i'm a crude animal sorry he's a barbiturate okay grim fandango according to wikipedia is an adventure game developed and published by lucas arts in 1998 oh it's older than you are i didn't even realize that mm -hmm. For Microsoft Windows with Tim Schafer, the legend himself, as the game's project leader. It is the first adventure game by LucasArts to use 3D computer graphics overlaid in on pre-rendered static backgrounds. Uh, as with other LucasArts adventure games, the player must converse with other characters and examine, collect, and use objects correctly to solve puzzles in order to progress. Uh, we played this on the PlayStation Vita, which is a like a gem of a handheld console. In case anybody wants to play excellent video games on the go. I love that thing. I know. Words. And they're so I, cheap now, I too. have to buy another one. Uh-huh. We should buy, like, as many as we can. Just buy, like... In the future, when when the wolves and the crows overtake us, um, those will be, like... Money? Uh, I wasn't going to say money. if Like, gold bars or something. Oh, okay. Because gold, of course, when the crows come... They kill people by dropping gold on their heads. <laughs> uh, we'll so gold army. will just be everywhere, yeah. We're, we'll have a crow army, though, that can use the Vitas. And they'll just play Borderlands or something. Anyways, we'll get in touch with the King of Kuwait. Okay, so, uh, do you want to go first, or should I go first? We go first. I'll go first? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, Grim Fandango. We played through this, uh, how long is the main campaign? You know this. It depends okay. on your smartness. Around 11 hours. <laughs> So for me, it probably was uh, thirty. So it's uh, it's not an overly long game. I it's really, like a season of TV, basically. I have to say, I love the fact that with these older games, it was so labor intensive to even get them made that they're shorter but they're denser, and there's the worlds are richer. There's stuff that you can miss, but it's not this protracted, long, drawn out. Uh, oh, geez, I'm getting burps. Um, like 60 hour thing. Just be careful you don't let them out like I do. Or you'll be. I just animal. choke. I just choke them back like a. Gentleman. I know. I should too. Um, but I suck. You don't. Uh, and instead, you get these long, drawn out games with a myriad of boring side quests uh, and uh, a meandering story that stops and starts sporadically. So, overall, I mean, this game's like 
legendary. Yeah. So, if you or I were to just come out and say, I didn't like it, that would be ridiculous. So, obviously, I'll say right out of the gate, loved it. It's... Can we have a brief description of the game itself instead of just the development? We just did, though. May I? Let's well, see. Let's did, see. You didn't really Wikipedia, the game Wikipedia at all. says, as yeah. with other LucasArts adventure games, the player must converse with other characters and no. examine... Oh, you okay, mean... Let me oh, hit, oh, let me hit okay, you Okay, hold on. Okay. Hold on. Grim Fandango's world combines elements of the Aztec... Ah, <laughs> the Aztec. <laughs> That's just underwear. Um, combines <laughs> elements of the Aztec <laughs> belief of afterlife... With style aspects of film noir, including the Maltese Fal- Falcon on the waterfront and Casablanca, I which we also uh, reviewed, and I understand Tim Schafer listened to that review and really liked it. Thanks, Tim. Um, to create the land of the dead, through which recently departed souls represented in the game oh, as Kalaka like figures must travel before they reach their final destination, the ninth underworld. The story follows travel agent Manny, Man- Manuel Manny. Calavera, as he attempts to save Mercedes Miche Colomar, a newly arrived but virtuous soul during her long journey. The game received universal acclaim for, from critics. Blah, 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 blah. So basically, you're a, uh, a little skeleton dude named Manny, as I said, and he sells travel packages to uh, souls who have arrived in uh, the underworld, I guess. The eighth underworld. The eighth underworld, in order to help them get to the ninth underworld. So. If you come to him and you've been a decent person in life, he can sell you a car or something, and then you can drive mm. to the ninth underworld. But if you've been bad, like the in the very opening of the game, so it's not a spoiler, mm-hmm. uh, he sells the guy a walking stick. <laughs> <laughs> and as per usual, I think we'll follow our rule that anything within the first about hour and a half doesn't count as a spoiler. So, But we'll still try not yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm saying, if you have to say something that happens one hour in, because the game's like 12 hours, you know, not the end of the world. This tea is really good. Um, okay, so give yeah. me your impressions. And, and it's and it's kind of like a, uh, I'd, I'd say Mexican Day of the mm. Dead. I don't know, like they say Aztec. You know. I'd say you, it's a, for lay people, as Mexican Day of the Dead is what yeah. this looks like, with the kooky looking little skeletons, with the, the... It, it yeah. is not in any way at all attempting to look realistic. It's a very cartoony. Uh, cartoony kind of world, but not in... Like, you look at some of their previous games, and it's like a really goofy, wacky-looking yeah. kind of cartoon. This is just more of a subtle... Muted color palette, sort of. Yeah, it's a little more It's a little more sophisticated, and that's yeah. uh, not saying a ton, but, you know, whatever. Uh, so, as I was saying, obviously, you know... I think you and I probably both loved it. Uh, Hated it. Uh, it's kind of it's one of those games where going into it, you know you're gonna love it. Uh-huh. Um, but going into it, I was really curious to see how it would work. I'm not an adventure game sort of person. I don't love neither of us are. I don't love going around solving obscure puzzles where oh you have to take that piece of drain pipe you found three hours ago and drain uh the monster's cyst with it or something like that mm. i hate having that was that. a bad one yeah um so i all i've done really is written down a list of pros and cons and i'll kind of work Same. my way through them uh it's difficult to do the systematic review of a game at like like i've gotten the album ones down from in my notes to a science just bap, 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 yeah but especially points. a lot of our listeners aren't huge game fans so yeah. we want to make it in depth enough that you can enjoy it but not like yeah, mega boring either. I, I'd, I'd like to think that somebody... Like, this is a game, too, where... If you're not a gamer, you would still love it. You, It's on PC. If you have a computer, you can play it. Like, yeah. I mean, I understand it's time-consuming, and most people don't have that kind of time. It's like the same as watching a season of TV. Everyone I know, but people TV. just think d- games are more time-consuming than they are. I guess. They're not. It's a myth. So, I... I for out of the, Right out of the bat, obviously, the characters um, and the writing are, like... I'd say... Probably second to none. I can't really think of another game I've played where the characters were so uh, humorous and and kind of, and like uh, Tim Schafer has said in a couple interviews I listened to or watched with him in it. Like there's this weird underpinning of tragedy to the whole world and mm-hmm. the whole uh, story. Everyone just died, but like still comedic tragedy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and everybody everybody is dead. You know, uh, but. The game's hilarious. Like, first and foremost, uh-huh. the game is hysterically funny. And I would often come home from 
from work where I, I work the evening shift and you'd be, we share a room, everybody, isn't that cute? Uh, and Jason would be asleep and I'd be playing the game on the Vita laying in bed and like convulsing with laughter and trying so hard not to just shriek with laughter and wake you up. Uh, and then in that, following that kind of uh, vein, the voice acting is also like supreme all across the board. The voice acting's like spot on exactly what you'd want it to be everybody's hamming it up a little bit but nobody's um overstepping uh their dramatic boundaries what were you wanting to that's say? exactly kind of what i was going to say so it's kind of weird that you said it i was going to say the voice acting is phenomenal but not for all the subtlety and range of emotion stuff a lot of the characters are like total cartoons and characters but in like the best possible way like i characters. mean that is what did I say? <laughs> you just pronounced caricature like character. Okay. Shoot Everybody me. knew what you meant. Shoot me. Do me a favor. Um, <laughs> and I think that's like not an insult. That's a great compliment because I think it accomplishes its goal perfectly. Yeah. And I'm slurring my words a lot. It must be all the mac and cheese. <laughs> yeah. Now, as I as I work my way through the game, uh, you go kind of from drastically different area to drastically different yeah. you there's a lot of there's four right yeah it's four, not a spoiler to say this four no four dramatic setting changes in the game spread and, over four years and going from each one of them i was at times struck with the slight unevenness of some of the puzzles and some of the difficulty of the puzzles yes. and the fact that from space to space particularly in year three of the game a lot of puzzles are of the same um bent like yeah. in in one of the years there's a lot of like physics based puzzles whereas in some of the other ones it's all inventory item based mm -hmm. where you you go around and you've got this thing in inside his suit and he reaches into his suit and pulls out all this stuff and you uh you have to interact with different uh things or characters in your environment with your items to solve the puzzles and keep the game moving forward so i did find that to be a bit of a shame just the slight uh off kilterness of the uh puzzle difficulty and the subject matter and the just direction that the puzzles went in but aside from that the puzzles for the most part weren't ridiculously hard but some of them were uh, there's like there's no way you're gonna figure these out without googling them and that's kind of the point with these uh, old adventure games is that they're so ridiculously hard that people have to um, come together and discuss and uh, and problem solve the game together yeah. it, you're not supposed to be able to as one person bulldoze through a game like this unless you're really patient or really yeah smart. it's just, but they're meant to spark discussion mm. and now Hey, do me a favor and change that to time instead of bars so that we can see how long we've been recording. Um, and then B, how much do you think you used a guide, like total ballpark? Because I know you, like, you didn't keep track. And also, what was your, like at what point would you give up and go for a guide? Um, uh, how many times did I use the guide? That's yeah, it's hard. like ballpark. That's like, really hard to say. Uh, I'd say... Probably under, well under 10 times. So, I'll, I'll throw out an estimate and say like 6, six yeah. 7. Uh, and I would use it if I had kind of exhausted in my mind everything that I could possibly do. If I went to every room in the area and took out every item and used it in every you know, place in that room. That's very different I than just my go, method. Uh, if I would get stuck... Oh, you just go, I would just go procedurally through the area and pull out my different items and use them, try and interact with everything in the room, uh, and just spray and pray. Yeah. Kinda. Uh, I'm going to say this, I guess, while we're, because this is a discussion as well. Um, because it, interesting, I, I guess I would think of doing that, but what I did, I would say I probably used a guide eight or nine times at least. I used it a lot. Because my mentality is, as soon as the level of frustration I was experiencing would exceed the amount of accomplishment you would feel if you beat it without a guide, I would go to a guide. Because and w but when were you playing it? W like, w what was the setting for you playing most of the time? 
Well, normally I was just like playing during the evening or night. Yeah, so what I think the difference there was that I was laying in bed just kind of, and then at times I would just zone out. So I didn't mind having to wind my way through yeah, the entire level and just space out and just kind of meditatively go through everything and try different combinations of stuff. Yeah. Because I, I definitely enjoy like puzzling. and I definitely tr would like try all my options and stuff. But the moment when I felt like I was just like too frustrated, I was like, well, I have no interest in playing a game yeah. to be frustrated. So I just look it up and get on with the story. Yeah. Um, Excuse me. going I didn't push that one out. I know you didn't. We're making going progress. sort of <laughs> going back to uh, what I was saying. Uh, you're winding your way through these four extremely different environments, but they still had a a really interesting feel of cohesion a and sense it, of world. It really did feel like a far ranging journey rather than uh, I want to do this setting i want to do one of these settings and, and you need a water level yeah it it didn't feel like that at all which you know kudos to the team for doing that and it really did have and i don't know how i i was thinking what are the elements that make a story feel this way and i can't really say but it really does nail that vintage film noir feeling uh and i know i've talked about film noir with a couple different people and they all don't know what I'm talking about, and I let's. I'm just gonna Google it really quick, just to. It's like a shadowy, smoky kind of like mysterious, intriguing sort. And of it thing. doesn't really make sense to. Okay, go ahead. A style or genre of cinematography, cinema, cinematog, sim, cinematographic, film, marked by a mood of pessimism, fatalism, and menace. The term was originally applied by a group of French critics. Oh, français to American thriller or detective films made in the period of 1944 and 55 to 55. Like 54, work, actually. 54, i.e. The work of directors, i.e. such as Orson Welles, Fritz Lang, and Billy Wilder. So I'd say mood of pessimism, fatalism, and kind of like the, if, if anybody's seen Casablanca, which we talked about. So of on course you see show, it. So you have gone to see it to compare your opinions with ours. Uh, that's kind of the style. It's kind of like a romance, but a doomed romance and a, a shadowy atmosphere, both literally and figuratively and metaphorically. Uh, and th it really nails that kind of vintage film noir feeling, which is really impressive yeah. when you're dealing with colorful, kooky Mexican Day of the Dead skeletons who are selling travel packages to each other to wind their way through this weird underworld with things like demonic beavers flaming uh, beavers that... flaming beavers who build uh dams of bones and uh and it's the the game to that end uh, is kooky it's far-ranging it's uh very very ambitious and even creative. even for now it's ambitious and wildly creative and it is jagged it is uneven but I think that for all that, the intention of the game shines through almost uninhibited. And it makes it like almost impossible to, uh, to love. It leverages the game's mechanics itself to like great comedic effect. I'm thinking of the conversation in the security guard uh, office kind of thing yeah. where uh, you've got different uh, responses to... To this her, woman's giving you her life story, basically. To her, yeah, you've got different responses to this conversation flying up, and you can choose them on the fly, but in the end, they don't really do anything, and it's super funny. Uh, it's it's still so immersive, though, despite all the jankiness. Define despite immersive, though. That's such a two-bit This is term. exactly what I wrote down. Most games now, I would say, are immersive. Um I forget why I saw an ad for the NES recently. <laughs> like the NES? The, the NES NES. Like, yeah, okay. the old one way back when. And they're like, this young man has entered a world of intrigue, magic, and fantasy. And he's playing Super Mario Brothers. And it's like, do, 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 do. And it's like, no, he has not entered like <laughs> any such world. He knows he's still, it's not, it doesn't pull, immersive means it pulls you and you forget about the crappy day you had at work or the stressful thing you got to do tomorrow or so you mean it's like all you're thinking about kind it's of thing. all you're thinking about and not in a bad way not in a your brainwashed uh, yeah, like yeah. when you put on a great movie and you're like wow this is so believable uh -huh. and it's so seamless that it's pulled me into this creative world that somebody's made for me 
and the game really nailed that. Again, despite the fact that it's Mexican Day of the Dead skeletons with flaming beavers and a demon who's created to drive cars named Glottis. Glottis. Uh, and that's... I can't, I can't believe that I was placed in the role of a, of a Mexican Day of the Dead uh, travel salesman skeleton. I, like that, that's, and it fits. Yeah, that's just that's such an achievement to me. Um, there were some, and I think you're going to get more into this. There's some issues with like the walk boxes and the actual technological oh limitations of the game. Tell me about it. That were frustrating, but I think I was only really stumped by that once hmm. in the game, where you have to navigate to a very specific portion of the room, and it's like you you want to try. You're trying to talk to somebody, and instead of just walking right up next to them like you would. Swivel you, that you have to, baby. You have to walk like back into the left or something away from the person to then engage in the conversation. Um, but uh, that really didn't draw me out of the game many times. It was just once, maybe twice, but I can really only remember one time that it did. And to finish off, holy Moses, the score in this game <laughs> is up there with any film score I've ever heard in my life. The achievement that that this score is 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 not to be underestimated and if you're listening to this and you want to hear something really epic and cinematic and interesting while you're doing the dishes or while you're driving to work or something seriously oh, yeah. go get the grim fandango score um find it i think you can buy it on their website seriously listen to it because it is a beautiful piece of work uh if you if you care. I would just and like to... Uh, now that's my review. Okay. That's my uh, two cents. Uh, so you're free to say whatever you want at this mm. point. I would just like to throw it. Also, I just realized... So we're reviewing this. Next week we're reviewing Hotline Miami. And I'm like, we're going to sound so uh, over-indulgent. Is that the term I'm looking for? Pretentious? Uh, no, because Hotline Miami also is one of the great game soundtracks of all time. <laughs> and yeah. so everyone's going to be like, oh, every game they're like... So but no, we're this, just... this soundtrack is much more like what you'd expect from yeah. a classic movie with like big orchestral oh, yeah. sounds and uh, awesome brass sounds. The trumpets, the tubas mm -hmm. just blaring in there and then kind of like a jazzy underline uh, or through line running through it. So, But seriously, both of those soundtracks, Hotline Miami yeah. and... Uh, Grim Fandango, two of the best, Sh should be listened to. You don't have to like video games to like this. You don't have to like film scores to like it. Yeah. But you will. That the central theme to Grim Fandango will get stuck in your head, and y you will feel like putting on a fedora, lighting a cigarette, and leaning against a wall in an alley as a beautiful woman walks by in a non creepy way. Well, in a mostly non creepy way, in a slightly non creepy way. But cool, in a creepy. creepy. Yeah, but cool, like creepy. super sexy, cool. Yeah. You better be wearing a suit. And as Frank Sinatra said, after the sun goes down, a man has to wear a black suit. It's dark out, and I'm wearing a wife beater and jeans, baby. The okay, suit of the turn. south. Um, okay, I'm going to go through pros and cons as well. Um, some of it's going to be the same as what you said, some of it, whatever. The characters, I think, uh, are so diverse, and like very seldom in games do I want to go talk to a character. But in this game, I think of your personal assistant kind of thing in year <laughs> two, Lupe, who's just like super bubbly and hilarious and adorable. And I would keep going back to her to see if she had new dialogue just because I enjoyed talking to her so much. Um, so characters were just like A+. Plus, and I mean, that ties into the writing, which was hilarious without ever seeming like try hard, you know? Yeah, it's, um, a, it's a very nonchalant, yeah. low-key kind of comedy, which I've been really getting into lately. Uh like with really... uh what's his face you like bread yeah yeah that's loki <laughs> you get like fully into it yeah um my dude anyways and i also say it was at times like it would be like touching and tense also but it was always tongue-in-cheek like it never seemed like serious you know um oh yeah it's, it's rife with um tropes yeah but they're purpose. so they're so lovingly handled and sparingly used that every time you see them, it just pulls you yeah. more into the story. You're, yeah, totally. Um, music, I think, like, I said, have written here, if the soundtrack was released, like, as an album and the game never existed, 
it would be a sick album. Yeah. Like just oh, yeah. especially my favorites are years two and four. Like year two just has this wicked smooth jazz year soundtrack. Two, year two like is for sure my favorite. Big sax and big band. Like yeah. I love big sax. Also, the setting is awesome. Oh, like oh. oh, oh, saxophone. No, this yeah, I like tenor sax, baritone sax, alto sax, soprano sax, big bass sax. Oh, <laughs> give me that big bass sax. <laughs> I love music. Um, the the setting is awesome. Great progression. I definitely had some areas I liked, like some whole years I liked a lot more than others in terms of setting. Um, I think we can both agree year two was probably our favorite, just like for everything. Yeah, in terms of the actual settings, it was super refreshing to play a game where it didn't feel like they were running out of money towards the end. Yeah, that's like, true. Like even some of our favorite games of all time, like I'm thinking of Dark Souls 1, Oh, you yeah. start off in Dark Souls 1, you're like, wow, this is <laughs> so the true. most well-designed, beautifully textured world I've ever played in. <laughs> and then by the end, you're like, they're just like, here's a line and some sprinkles. <laughs> Walk along the line. That's so And you're like, though. holy Moses, you guys were, it looks like an MS Paint I love project. Some sprinkles. Uh, Thank you, Miyazaki. Yeah, and this game um, is and I know I was just saying a second ago it's rough and uneven, um, but that's only in a in a minorly janky sort of way. Aside from the quality of mm -hmm. the game, totally even throughout, and that's yes. a, a massive accomplishment that you don't see today. So would you say that Year Two was your favorite though? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, it was just so. Oh, it's uh, uh, let's not should, talk should, about it. No, yeah, we shouldn't far say in. about what it what it mirrors. It it has a Casablanca vibe. A That's little, a little bit of a Casablanca. Yeah. Just a bit. If you watch Casablanca right before you go into year two, you're going to enjoy year two yeah. so much more. Um, the art, I think you didn't touch on a ton. The character models hold up shockingly well because they're very smooth to begin with. And they, so, were, also, they were also, we played the remastered version. But the and character the models were version hardly is, touched. Actually, oh. they were, because um, I watched the making of yeah. Grim Fandango remastered in preparation to do this. And they did do, like, an amazing amount of uprezzing. Like, oh, I'm they, sure they did. I was watching the one guy uprez uh, Manny's shoes. Huh. Like, the the textures on his shoes, removing, like, I'll all the relicking. That. Yeah. And it, it looks completely different. Um, and the, the characters do look noticeably better. Yeah. Um, but what I believe they didn't touch at all was their pre-rendered backdrops. Yeah. For people who aren't uh, into games... A game like Grim Fandango, the characters are in 3D, but everything around them, the background, even the objects, are basically just 2D paintings kind of thing. Like, just a JPEG, basically. Yeah. But they're beautiful still. So, because of that, yeah. they don't age as quickly. They um, don't age. Yeah. Really. And so, I think that uh, some of the places still made me, like, stop and look, just because it was like, Yeah, wow. both of us said. The blue Took so many the screenshots. Blue, the Blue Casket. Both yeah. of us, when we walked like, past whoa. this place called the Blue Casket, we were like, Whoa! It's just a beautiful, yeah, good and lighting, wildly like, creative, mm, and and yeah. really well colored too. Spunky, yeah. Um, the trophies rocked. Some people aren't really into getting trophies. Just just for those who don't know what trophies are, trophies are like if you complete a hundred levels, they give you a, a notification saying you got this trophy. And it's meaningless, but also yeah. fun. But these ones rock. You mostly get them if you unlock funny or hard to get dialogue. Yeah. Um, and so now even looking over them, I still kind of laugh when I see some stuff. Um, like one of the trophies you can get if you wave a Robert Fro a balloon that's shaped like Robert Frost at some pigeons. And Manny goes, run you pigeons, and then, it's Robert Frost. And like that's, like, the that's the sort of thing you'd really only get in this game. And it would yeah. legit make you laugh because... In so many other games, movies, whatever, sh TV shows especially, they try and just pelt you with funny moments like that. Yeah. But when they're spread Space out and they're that. disparate and you yeah. don't really see them coming and you're walking around with the Robert Frost balloon <laughs> sculpture just, trying to... just because and you just want to see what will happen if you wiggle it at the pigeons yeah. and then Manny says, run you pigeons, it's Robert Frost. And then you just crack up yeah. because it's just like... You don't expect it to do I anything. I love the fact that they they believed in this world enough and they believed in... Yeah. The characters enough. And they believed in the way that the player would interact yeah. with that world enough to yeah. know that 
that was going to happen. But yeah, some of the tro- like you get someone to be like, you know, what I did back in the fat days is none of your business. And like, then the trophy pops and you're like, that's just really yeah. funny stuff. Um, one other pro that you didn't touch on specific to the remastered version is there's a developer commentary throughout the whole thing. It was awesome. It spoiled one or two little puzzles, but like not nearly enough to make it not worth using. Mm-hmm. Um, in almost every uh, like frame, like building. Chocolate cake. I love chocolate cake. I finished mine. In like every building and in a lot of the shots, you can press a button and then a couple of people who worked on the game back in 98 just kind of talk about it and reminisce or explain difficulties or things they enjoyed about it. And it really enriched the experience because it was like sitting down with the guys and it was fantastic. Um, now let's get into the negatives. I should start doing negatives first because I feel like it always leaves a sour taste in things that I like. Um, I felt that the villains were never fleshed out nearly enough. Arguably, the two main villains ended up feeling kind of incidental to me. I was just like, especially... That's, that's an interesting especially point. Especially, uh... there's one right near the end where there's an encounter, um, which you'll know what I'm talking about. But I was just like, I barely even know who this guy is. Yeah, like, that's just, true. Yeah, I, It didn't feel weighty enough because, I don't know, there's the, just no development for them. The one villain, I don't think it's a spoiler to say, is like your office nemesis. Yeah. And I found him to be pretty funny. And like, he was, but he's just guy. he's just a classic Manny's office nemesis. He gets more sales than yeah. Manny and that sort of thing. And that that's fine. But then the quote unquote big bad guy, I was like, wait, who are who you? Is again? he? Yeah. Uh, and I now that you say that, I totally agree. Yeah, that was and, one of my biggest complaints of the game. Although Although I feel like you still did feel like he was a powerful and menacing figure. Yeah, but you didn't know anything about... I but, don't even know his name now. Uh, Seriously. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Um, next complaint, and I actually have quite a few. Um, why is there no hint system in the remastered version? I know I'm a little dense sometimes, but, like, help me out here. Um, I think, like I said, I probably use the guide close to or ten times. Um... I think, and you touched on this a bit, but I had more trouble with it. Hitboxes sucked. So a hitbox is... A walkbox. box. A walk box, whatever. There's a certain space within where, like, if your character's standing between this pixel and this pixel, if you press the button, he does a certain thing, basically. Um, and I would say at least three times, and probably more, I had the right solution. Um, <laughs> I had the right solution for solving a puzzle. Didn't use the right hitbox. <laughs> Gris on the Bristol stool chart right now. <laughs> Look at this poor dude. Look at type 3. He's so happy. <laughs> oh, type 4. <laughs> so I have to poo. And in, in order to... Will you embed this in the video? In order to tell... Yeah, I can put this Look in at your video. screen right now to in, see the Bristol stool chart. Yeah. <laughs> the Bristol stool chart uh, is unreal. Because uh, I... I quite need to. Uh, it's so. I quite need. I quite need so a pass. Relatable. <laughs> I quite need to pass a, a warm patch, uh, and I was just telling Jason that by writing him uh, a note on my notepad and then holding up my notepad and then I googled poops. Yeah. Since we're running a little bit uh, long, I think honestly we should just cut it out. To be honest with you, when you leave. Um, yeah, we can cut it out. I don't care. Okay, and then let's see. Wait till I'm finished, though. You pinch it off. Mm-hmm. Um, so multiple times, I would say at least three times, I was like, I had the right idea to solve the puzzle, but I just didn't have him quite positioned in the right place. So then I ended yeah. up Googling it, and then I'm like, well, I see it, so now I feel dirty and like a loser and a fool. It does suck when you have the yeah. idea, and then you're like, crap, like this should totally be... It seems be... like such a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this makes so much sense. And then you look it up, and you were actually right, and it was just yeah. a finicky technological quirk that kept you from being able to solve it. Yeah. I totally agree with you. I think the difficulty curve is almost the opposite of what you want. Um, part of it is that I don't play adventure games hardly at all, and it so by the end, you you're getting in the mindset. to get. I was just yeah. going to say to get adjusted to the logic of the yeah. world. Or but the still, I think the last quarter of the game is the easiest by far, um, which is a little bit unsatisfying. Um, it's... <sighs> It is, but also I feel like it's needed to build up a bit of momentum going yeah, into the last maybe. act. I need to stop talking because I need to concentrate. Um, overall, though, I think that 
this is actually one of my favorite games of all time. No joke. Like, top 20, probably. The um, thing maybe is, even top 10. I don't know. Sometime we should talk about our favorite games and one what day. makes, like, a one really, day. like, a, a good game. This, and this is no knock against Grim Fandango. I would almost not classify as a game experience. It's not a game like experience no it's a narrative experience it's almost more like a book okay uh overall i think it's in this, uh, the dialogue the characters the art and the awesome dev commentary all come together to make a really special experience the commentary um, is great what happens is you walk up to a thing and you look at it and then there's a little you get a little uh light up thing that's the l button and then you press the l button and then they talk for a little like yeah I 30 seconds it. and then oh did you i'm yeah. sorry um, i'm seeing through okay. like a brown Go haze. poop it's Okay. Minutes. We're really I'm, sorry. I'm back and I'm lighter than I was when I left. Okay, so next up we're doing Electric Warrior. Shall I just yeah. steam right into we this? Have this conversation. We don't need to have this conversation. Whoever we do need to have this conversation. One, what if starts both? What if yeah, but it's it's different when you're starting. I guess. As opposed to when you finish. Okay. Whatever. Um, okay, Electric Warrior is the sixth studio album by English rock act T-Rex. I would dispute that they're rock, rock act, but whatever. The album marked a turning point in the band's sound, dispensing with the folk-oriented music of the group's previous albums. Heck that. And pioneering a flamboyant, pop-friendly take on electric rock and roll, known yeah. as gl glam rock. The album reached number one on the UK charts and became the best-selling album of 1971. It did it. Yep, the top 10 single, Bang A Gong, Get It On, also became the band's only U.S. hit. Electric Warrior has since received Sorry, acclaim guys. as a pivotal release of the glam rock movement. Uh, so, as you just heard, Electric Warrior, an album by T-Rex, released in 1971, uh, kind of fronted, masterminded by Mark Bolin, who was... A very moderately successful folk musician before forming the band and then became kind of uh, this enigmatic uh, character after I'd say the release of this album and then he only lived for a couple more years before uh, sadly dying uh, uh, in a car accident the album was produced by none other than Tony Visconti who has produced literally every good album that's ever been made uh, and yeah, I'd say the the uh, the sound of this album, the the overall production and instrumentation, is very much in vogue right now. And that's not why we decided to talk about it. It just happens to be. Um, just kidding. We're I'm, selling out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're only talking about popular stuff now. I'd say it has a lot in common with the Black Keys album uh, "Turn Blue" in terms of. Uh, the production, that kind of vintage, vibey uh, sound that you hear a lot of. It's very dense. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of orchestration, really, like orchestral sounds, and there's a lot of uh, brass sounds coming in, and, and layered electric guitar and layered vocal tracks and that sort of thing. The album borrows heavily from blues and a little bit from folk, and very much so from psychedelic rock. To create this really this fusion that now it seems evident and obvious and uh almost overplayed but then nobody nobody was doing this sort of thing right. and, and it was significant and i think it's i think it's hugely overlooked because i really haven't talked to literally anybody who's like even heard of this album yeah i mean i've been aware of t-rex for a long time but i've never listened to it i i've i've listened to this album off and on for a couple of years yeah uh, but never really sat down and gave it like a critical listen. And I'm super glad that I did. Uh, there are so many good songs on it too. Uh, I tried to do a top three, but it kind of became a top four. And when we were listening to it uh, yesterday, it kind of became a top five. So I'm just going to run through the ones that I really like. Mambo Sun, which is the opening track, is so chill and has the bongos coming in and all the songs are so catchy and you just really like you they would be totally in place in like a car commercial now yeah. or something like that so mambo sun uh i really like get it on bang on get it on which is their 
uh, single, and it sounds very much like the Black Keys. I I wrote this long diatribe in my loose outline for my notes about how I feel super sorry for anybody who thinks the Black Keys are doing anything new and original because it's been happening since uh, the seventies. <laughs> so, but I'm not gonna rant on that. I'm not gonna rant on it, even though I just did in passing. Black Keys suck, but you know, uh, they don't suck. They don't really suck, but their derivative is as all hell, and they're not that great. Yeah. Uh, Lean Woman Blues. Oh, what a tune! Amazing, Lean amazing song. Uh, Cosmic Dancer, and these these song titles are giving you a bit I of a sense you. of of kind of the the themes, <laughs> not not even the themes, but the tone, I guess, of the album. And then Rip Off, uh, the closing track. I really like. It's kind of like a punk. Uh, punk sounding but like with orchestration which is something uh, you're only starting to hear from like, bands like Cage the Elephant now yeah. and it's like it's a really cool sound it's a really cool uh, punchy sort of arrangement um, it, it does sit like I said at the crossroads of you know hippie folk and and blues rock psychedelic rock and and the it's aged I think astonishing astonishing Thanks, Tony Viscosi. Yes, it's aged very well, but it's hard for me to tell if it's aged really well or if this sounds just very uh, trendy right now, because it it, be both. it is that kind of vibey, uh, layered, dense. Uh, you got the vocals buried a little bit, and and all that sort of thing. Um, I it does invoke, like I said, uh, obviously the Black Keys would be what comes to mind immediately. And I think a lot of that's the vocal melodies uh, and that sort of thing. But on the song Jeepster, which is kind of like a country-inflected thing, I did hear uh, a bit of the Cars yeah. from the from the '80s with like a Best Friends Girl with a country-inflected yeah. pop song that I really, really enjoyed. Um, every song lyrically is like completely hilarious, and maybe it's intentional, maybe it's unintentional. They're so cheesy, not even cheesy. They're very hippie. Um, like I think one of the lines is I'm just a beggar in the sand with a, the sky in my hand Yeah, baby. And, and like it's very you know cosmic but I don't think and, it's tongue in cheek maybe I don't know I, I think it might be it must be a little tongue in cheek it has know. to be but all the songs are pretty much um, from a man sung to a woman about you know how I he's she's so she's so you're so cosmic baby that I turned into a pegasus and ate the sun now I made that up. That's not actually what I was, but you get the you get the idea. Um, but the the earthy hippie mus the, the musings, the earthy hippie musings actually provide like kind of an interesting counterpoint for kind of a more grungy, gritty rock sound, and it's just a funny, amusing. You're not gonna you're not gonna cry while listening to this album, I don't think, and you're not gonna no you're not gonna. Uh, depart from it a changed person but it's a killer album just for listening to and i put it on uh at work the other day for my one co-worker adam who is uh, a pretty big music f head music head whatever he likes music quite a bit and he he started off going oh yeah you know this is cool this is great and then when i got to lean woman blues which is very bluesy very slow heavy oh, yeah. but with a really not bluesy uh pop kind of vocal melody he his eyes just lit up and he he suddenly got it yeah. and then for every other song that i played off the album i played like almost the entire album he was bobbing his head he was stamping his feet and he loved it and i think that um if you go into the album not expecting anything profound but just looking for a Groove. really f not i don't want to say feel good but a really great soulful classic yeah. sounding album that's that's, that's what you're gonna get and as i as i listened through it i was kind of tormented by the fact that it's so shallow in its substance until i um i i came upon the realization that i think in the case of an album like this it's not a bad thing to enjoy it when it's all style because then i think the style becomes the substance of the album that yeah, you're listening that's to valid. and the music and the overall package is the statement the artistic statement in and of itself and it doesn't have to be deeply poetic it doesn't have to be leonard cohen mm -hmm. uh for you to for you to enjoy it and get something out of it and i definitely enjoyed and got something out of this album i have very little 
criticism to level at it, if any. Interesting. That's it? Yep, that's it. Okay. Gotta get a move on. Um, okay, so this is what I'm talking about when I talk about a perfect balance of cohesion, but with songs that have like a unique feel. I think uh, when we reviewed Roman Lips by Omar Rodriguez Lopez, I said it had like a nice flow, but the song just never felt individualistic enough. This album is a perfect example of what I want when I want an album where all the songs feel unique, but they flow so well. It all sounds like one artist and one album. The great thing... That's the strong suit in my mind. I think the, the kind of secret weapon of that is that it was their first quote-unquote rock album. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, okay, if we're making this transition from folk to rock, we're going to need a bluesy kind of song, a punky kind of song, and they nailed down but all these... But it didn't these... seem forced. No, I know, but they nailed down all these bases in a yeah. really playful, fun kind of sure. manner, and that's why you get the diversity, and mm. every song on the album is awesome. I stifled that verb altogether. I think, like, there's 11 tracks on the album. I would say it's the perfect length. <laughs> the album... Oh, okay, yeah. guys, hold on. Are we? No, let's not tell it. The perfect length is an in-joke, and now it's part of the podcast, but we're not going to tell you yeah. why it's an in-joke. We get it. Whenever somebody says it's the perfect length, just wink at them. Yeah, that's an inside joke, but just between us, kind of, so sorry. Right, but now it's in between you, but you can't know why. Yeah, you just don't know why. Okay. Um, the album has such an awesome groove um, that comes from its impeccable production quality. Um it's like, it's hard to describe this well. It's like all the imperfections were sifted out of each song, but it never, I never think it, I don't think it Whoa. ever uh, smoothed out or watered down any of T-Rex's like just musical charm. Like it's such an interesting, like quirky sound that they have. Um, in tracks like Cosmic Dancer, I think it's also worth noting that what do you say the vocalist's name is? What's his name? What's his name? What's his name? Mark Bolin. Mark Bolin. He actually has a very unique voice. Um, that's a great tune. That never seems annoying. I would compare it to almost Joe Strummer, but more Joe Strummer of the Clash, but more palatable. He's got a very he's got kind of like a nasally sort of yeah. voice, but it's still tuneful. And yeah. it, like he can still carry a melody with his voice. Mm -hmm. And that song Cosmic Dancer, which is exactly what you're thinking in your head would a song called Cosmic Dancer would sound like. It's kind of folk driven with the strings that come in with this very corny melodramatic yeah. would you like so cheese good. with that sir kind of thing but it re like that's that's a really good song and it, oh. it only occurred to me on the last listen how it's a powerful song too i think i think the most powerful one on the album um the album actually reminds me of rodriguez in a bit yeah. and that it sounds really unique but it's not too far out there normally yeah. when someone's like that's a really unique album you think of like <laughs> like omar rodriguez lopez exactly like that yeah um i was just doing that because that sounded yeah. eerily similar to your song <laughs> <laughs> um but it's not too out there it's just like it's not just innovation for innovation's sake um i think it manages to be moody and somehow still fun which is a really difficult thing to pull off, and I think that's like a huge strength of the album. Um, that said, though, the production of the album is chocolate cake. That said, though, the <laughs> write that down. That'd be a good uh, end of episode one. Uh, the uh, the production of Electric Warrior is so far beyond anything Rodriguez did. It's like comical to compare the two in that regard. Um, yeah. And T-Rex is also way less lyric based, more groove based. Yeah. Um, I just can't like understate how well produced the album is. If Rodriguez had been in T-Rex, oh. that would have been a good band. Maybe, um, who knows. The album is like almost every song has so many layers, but it never like beats you over the head with them. Um, they work together to produce something that still feels like really human and real. It never sounds like synthetic or contrived or it, like, listen to all my layers. It uh, reminds me of when we were talking about the Joshua Tree, and I said it toes a line between 
production value and the human quality authenticity of, of making music and i don't really know it sounds old like it yeah. sounds like yeah, a yeah. vintage recording but i don't really know why mm -hmm. uh it might be something in the the low end the bass end isn't quite what it's not over embellished like it isn't every album that's made today pretty much yeah but it does you're right it does have like some sort of charm yeah but it's not a imperfection based yeah. charm it's just authentic yeah um i have very few criticisms with the album i could knock it for like and i feel like i i almost wrote down like it doesn't have enough soul but then instead my note here says i might knock it for not having enough soul but in reality, that's basically a throwaway term for when a critic wants to dislike something but just can't find a more valid critique. Mm -hmm. But I do have one major criticism, and that's that I don't think the lyrics are very special. Um, they're not bad, and they don't really distract from the groove, which I agree is like the purpose of the album. Um, but they never stand out either. And I think that's what kept the album from being really special and one of my favorites. I was thinking about this, like, what takes a great album like this and makes it like one of my favorites? And I think it's the lyrics that I have to think about, like, something oh, yeah, that makes yeah. me think when I'm not listening to it. I would throw this album on and groove and be like, this is great, and the album is great. But I didn't really think about it a lot when I wasn't listening to it. And I think if it had had great lyrics, it would have been vaunted to be, like, great. But like I was saying, uh, this um, album really helped, along with, like, David Bowie's early stuff, to launch glam rock. And glam yeah. rock is all about the costumes the, groove. the stage presence the groove the style the groove and as i was saying the style of this album is the substance of it and i totally agree with the lyrics are just hippie hippie ridiculousness yeah uh, maxed out uh. and i don't think i don't think it'd be necessary for it to have good lyrics it's still a really good album but i don't think it would have hurt put it that way no of course not um my favorite songs um I always try and pick three. We're Cosmic Dancer, mm -hmm. a Monolith, which is a great song, and Lean Woman Blues. Like come Lean on. Woman Blues, it's like just you, so good. Especially he co he comes it's in my with favorite. a one, two, and buckle my shoe, and then it's like boom, <laughs> and it's like even slower than what yeah. you counted it in, <laughs> but it hits even harder, and you're just yeah. like, whoa! Like it's the so moment, good. the moment that song kicks into gear, I'm just like, woo. It's, yeah, it's, it's so good. So, it's so good. But that's all my thoughts. I think it's Grim Fandango is um it's actually an interesting pairing because I think Grim Fandango is one of my favorite names of all time now, despite it having quite a few what I would deem serious flaws. Um it's like what people have said about Dark Souls, where it's bad in all the ways that don't make it not a great game. Yeah. Um and then to contrast, I think Electric Warrior is a great album that I have very few criticisms with, but it just isn't one of my absolute favorites. No, I still yeah. really like I, it. I agree. But it's not like, if someone's like, what's I, one of your favorite albums? I'm not going to say that. Though the nice thing about doing these reviews and doing these discussions is uh, um, now that I have a a deeper understanding and and a better, stronger relationship with the album, I now know where it fits Yeah, in, sure. in my life as, and it's really good. as an album. And it's perfect for throwing on when you're driving and you, you're you in a great mood and you want to feel like you're, you you want to be in an even better mood. Yeah. Or when you're washing the dishes and you just want to just want to wiggle your hips yeah. while, you, while you you're elbow, glide through while those you're dishes. Elbow you know? deep in the suds and you just want to feel like a cosmic dancer uh, swinging through the Milky Way. And if you're listening to this, you are a cosmic dancer. Yeah. So, um, so p share our episode awesome. for not for share. promotional reasons no. whatsoever, but share our episode onto your Facebook page and say, I'm a cosmic dancer. <laughs> That's a lot to ask. It's not promotional in any way for us. Nobody's going to click on the link and listen to us. <laughs> That's but a just, good share, point. just share the episode That's and say, point. I'm a cosmic dancer. You want to listen to this? You want to be a cosmic dancer too? Hey, Everybody, everybody's a cosmic dancer so long as they it's quantum, listen, baby. So long as they listen to our podcast. And hello to Jason Isaacs. Hello to Jason Isaacs. Um, amen. So this has been episode seven, seven or something. I don't of know. The Good ship, brothership. Next week, because Ben Siebert told us we had to tell everybody what we're which talking is a great about idea. Next time, yes. Please, seriously, if you have literally any ideas, even if it's just 
one little thing that we did that you didn't like or you did like, seriously let us know because we're still trying to improve. Yeah, I appreciate Ben told me yeah. he liked some things. He was like, you guys should do this. And I was like, you know what? That's actually a really good idea. Yeah. So I, we're going to start saying what we're reviewing next show at yeah. the end of our show. If, if we remember, which yeah. we have today. And next week, we are reviewing the very interesting... Uh, film Drive by Nicholas Winding Refn starring Ryan Gosling and we are uh, reviewing one of my all time favorite games it's not a spoiler to say that I don't think no. Hotline Miami which is super cool and they're both both of these both this game and this uh, film I think have some direct connections I think they reference each other well not each other I think Drive reference or I think Hotline Miami references Drive a little bit yeah. and I am very excited for this pairing. I think it's going to be one of the best pairings yeah. we've done on the show. Hotline Miami is, I'm not going to say inexcusably, but I'll say arguably because that's a good out. Hotline Miami is arguably the most dissectable game ever created in yeah. terms of viewer interpretation. Yeah, and it's going to be very interesting. We're going to have the big cork board behind us with yarn going from theory. like... That's what it's called. Whatever. We're going to have a big... We're going to have string theory all up in here. It's going to look like a, a knitting spider's yeah. spider web thing. And there's going to be pictures of all of you with your faces blurred out. And it's going to have question marks. Who's that man? Even though we know it's you, Emerson. Emerson? Emerson, if you're listening to me right now, we know it's you. Emerson, we know it's you. Stop so, playing. We've crossed over the hour mark and my toes are slowly turning into little blue potatoes. So I think that means it's time to take her home. Oh, Thank you for sailing on the good ship today. I hear the bell ringing because we're coming to the sea. No. That's a, that's a <laughs> that's sad a, bell. bell. Brick, brick. We okay. see land ho. Thanks for sailing with us, everybody. And uh, if you check out either of the things we talked about, please let us know what you thought. If you have any suggestions, you can uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, RSS, <laughs> MySpace. Hit us up on Tumblr. MySpace. Don't use Vine anymore. Or WhatsApp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just no, Facebook, if you, if you, please. Yeah, please just Facebook us because we don't exist on we'll, any We'll have platform. Instagram eventually, but we, well, no promises. Okay. Snort. Kill it. Poop. <laughs> <laughs> we're going downhill so fast. These, remember when these were good and snappy short episodes and we... In years uh, gone by... Let's let it run for a bit, yeah. just in case. In years gone by, people are... Actually, probably just by next episode, everyone's gonna be like, "The best days are over." Yeah. Episode two to four was the yeah. golden age. These guys suck now. Now they've got oh, all the fame's gone to their heads. Yeah, that one time Jason got talked to about saying stuff at the end of the episode in the soup kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> was that so, actually in the soup kitchen? Yeah. Oh my gosh! Someone's gonna come up to me. I'm gonna be walking down that's, the street, and someone's gonna come up to me like, "Remember who you were?" <laughs> yeah, that's 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 our kind of show. Our <laughs> fans come up and talk to us about it in soup kitchens. <laughs> that's no hate against you, Ben. It just sounds funny. Kill it. Bye. That said, though, the production of the album is. <laughs> Ha ha ha!